Hello everyone. Our topic this time is ultrastructure of the cell. This is only part one. We will be dealing with nucleus and cell membrane. This lecture is primarily based on STAR and Taggart 2004, Biology, Unity and Diversity of Life, 10th edition. Let's just have a quick review of the eukaryotic cells as represented by animal and plant cells. Typical animal cell has the following organelles. The mitochondrion, plasma membrane, cytoskeletal components, nucleus, vesicle, the ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, and Golgi body. Plant cells do have similar cell organelles with animal cells except that plant cells possess chloroplasts, the bigger central vacuole, and the cell wall. Now let us take a closer look at the nucleus. Let's see the nuclear envelope, the nucleoplasm and the chromatin, and the nucleolus. This is a micrograph of the nucleus. Now let's see the nuclear membrane first. This is the nuclear membrane, a double layered structure that encloses the contents of the nucleus. The outer layer of the membrane is connected to the endoplasmic reticulum. The envelope helps to maintain the shape of the nucleus and assists in regulating the flow of molecules into and out of the nucleus through nuclear pores. Nucleoplasm is the gelatinous substance within the nuclear envelope, also called karyoplasm. This semi-aqueous material is similar to cytoplasm and is composed mainly of water with dissolved salts, enzymes, and organic molecules suspended within. The nucleolus is a dense membrane-less structure composed of RNA and proteins. Some of the eukaryotic organisms have a nucleus that contains up to four nucleoli. More closely to the nuclear envelope. The nuclear envelope controls the passage of substances between the interior of the nucleus and the cytoplasm. The nuclear envelope consists of two lipid bilayer. The outer bilayer faces the cytoplasm where the inner one faces the nucleoplasm. Nuclear pores span the envelope. Each pore is an organized array of membrane protein where ions and small diameter molecules move passively through the pores. Large molecules such as ribosomal units are moved in more controlled ways. Now let's take a closer look at the cell membrane. All cell membranes have the same lipid bilayer structure. The bilayer consists of two sheets of phospholipid molecules oriented in opposite direction. The heads of the phospholipids are facing outward. They are attracted to the water environments inside and outside of the cell. The hydrophobic phospholipid tails are sandwiched between the heads. This minimizes their interaction with water. Now, what is the cell membrane for? One of the functions of the cell membrane is transport and that is being aided by different transport proteins found in the cell membrane. So let's take a look at each of these proteins or transport proteins. First, the adhesion protein. It is helping one cell to adhere to another cell or to a protein component of an extracellular matrix. This is the ribbon model of protein integrin. Communication protein of the plasma membrane uh, is matching up with the communication protein of an adjoining cell. Together, they form a channel that connects the cytoplasm of the two cells 
and enables transmission of signal between them. This example here is a gap, gap junction. Receptor proteins embedded in the membrane are docks for diverse hormones and other signals. This is a ribbon model of receptor protein for somatotropin or growth hormone. Recognition proteins are identity tags by which cells recognize self and non-self. They are glycoprotein with side sugar chains projecting above the membrane. Examples shown here are models of identity tags of red blood cells. Passive transport proteins are channels that passively enable one or more substances to cross the membrane. Some are always open. Others have molecular gates that open and close in more controlled ways. Active transport proteins are called ATPase pumps. Energy provided by ATP makes them active pump solutes across the membrane. The blue ribbon model here is for calcium transport across the membrane. The multicolored ribbon model is of an ATP synthase. It pumps hydrogen ions that leads to ATP synthesis. How do transport proteins work or how do transporters work? This is an example here of a passive transport. This is a lipid bilayer model of the cell membrane showing the glucose transporter and glucose molecules. Glucose binds to a vacant site in the channel through a transport protein, which changes the transporter its shape. Glucose is now exposed to the fluid and released. It detaches and that leaves the channel. When the binding site is vacant, the protein goes back to its original shape. Glucose moves across concentration gradient, and so it continues until the concentration is equal. That's why we have three in here and the three in here, and so diffusion stops. Now, here is an example of active transport. Active transport of calcium begins when ATP binds to a calcium pump. This is a type of transporter in the cell membrane. Here, okay? So calcium enters a tunnel through the transporter and binds to a functional group inside. Binding causes the transporter to accept a phosphate group from ATP. ATP and then changes the shape and then calcium is released. ADP and phosphate group are also released. The protein returns to its original shape. In living cells, the calcium pump helps keep the calcium concentration in a cell at least 1,000 times lower than the outside. Another characteristic of the cell membrane is its selective permeability. When we say selective, what does it mean? Let's have a quick look at these molecules here on the left. The sucrose, oxygen, sodium ion, carbon dioxide, bicarbonate, and GNA. Let's see what happens if these molecules would try to move across the cell membrane. Let's start with the DNA. Uh, this is a large molecule, so it cannot diffuse. But about bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is charged, so it cannot diffuse. Carbon dioxide can. There it goes. Sodium ion cannot also because it's charged. And oxygen can, similar to carbon dioxide. Sucrose cannot because it's a large molecule. Now here is the sodium potassium pump as uh, another activity occurring in the cell membrane. Almost all animal cells actively pump sodium ions outward and potassium ions inward across the plasma membrane. The process begins when ATP transfers a phosphate group to the pump. 
binding of the phosphate group changes the shape of the sodium binding site so that it can bind sodium ion from the intracellular fluid. Binding of the sodium triggers the change of the shape of the pump. Sodium is then released into the extracellular fluid, which makes the pump activated for potassium binding. Similarly, binding of the potassium changes the shape of the binding site and it goes to the intracellular fluid. Phosphate is also released. The pump is now ready to start the cycle again. Another function of the cell membrane is phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is an active form of endocytosis by which an amoeba can capture using its pseudopods. Okay, so the plasma membrane of the extension fused together, engulfing the prey in a phagocytic vesicle. Such vesicle fused with lysosomes in the cytoplasm and their content, contents are digested. Well, that's all for the part one. In the ultrastructure of the cell part two, we will be discussing about endomembrane system, mitochondria, and specialized plant cell organelles. So I hope you got something from this lecture. Thank you very much for watching.